What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is July 7th of 2021. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And in today's video, I want to spend some time to talk about one of my favorite data science models when it comes to analyzing Bitcoin and the broader trend. And it's no other than the two-year MA multiplier tool that can be found online for free through lookintobitcoin.com. Now, I want to spend some time to talk about why I love this data science model. There are a ton out there, but I want to be very clear before we dive into why I like this data science model that there are no one-size-fits-all data science models or models that are going to guarantee telling you where we are within the trend, right? It is good to use a variety of data science models. So we'll spend some time here going through on the channel talking about a variety of those models. So if you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel. Let's go ahead and dive into the conversation, guys. So why do I like the two-year MA multiplier? Well, first off, I think it's important to talk about what it is before we dive into why I like it. So just to provide some context, it's actually a relatively simple data science model. And I've found over the years that the most simplistic takes out there on longer term time frames tend to pay out best. The two year MA multiplier applies two different values onto the logarithmic and long term chart for Bitcoin. It applies the two year moving average, which takes the closing price of the last two years worth of price action. So each day taking that closing price and averaging it out to the current day where we stand, right? Here on July 7th. And along with that as well, it not only takes that value, but it takes that value and multiplies it by five times. So let's say, for example, the average price here from July 6th, this is the most recent data we have to work with because it's yesterday's close, was 19445 bucks. right? What this data science model is going to do is it's going to multiply it by five times, and we get a value that Bitcoin hasn't even reached yet of $97,226 really edging closer to that $100,000 or more price target. Now, something that I want to talk about here, now that we have a general concept of the data science model, and you can feel free to read the description down here on the website if you guys need any further clarification. What I find really interesting about this data science model is the consistency in it, and outside of that as well, how it shows us how Bitcoin can sometimes, especially in the existing cycle that we're in, sometimes have exaggerated sell-offs and exuberant rallies that don't signal market tops or market bottoms. So I want to go ahead and, and I'll try to provide as much clarity as I can on this. So let's go ahead and analyze history here and we're going to compare about how it differs to the existing cycle. So we can take a look at the 2017 cycle. We can see that during these nice periods of time where we're below the green line, these are what would be known as the peak capitulation, accumulation phases when it comes to smart money. Smart money is slowly acquiring large um, you know, tranches of Bitcoin, large positions, eventually to dry up supply as the halving event comes in and prices start to move higher. And then what happens is that we tend to go into a red zone that usually lasts anywhere from around a month to a month and a half. And in this period of time, this is the period or window of time where we should start to be a bit more cautious. It doesn't mean that you have to take profits right when you cross the red line, but it means that within about a month's period, you should expect a market top. Now, we can see this consistently back here in 2013, back here in 2011, and we can see it here during a mid-cycle correction in March and April of 2013 where we saw Bitcoin's price go from $200 down here towards around $70, right? About a 66% correction here is went from around 210 to around $70. So we can see here that this model, right, historically shows us the peak capitulation periods to acquire. We can see it here. We can see it over here, right? We had during our most recent bear market, the last bear market in 2015, and then the bear market in 2011 as well as the tops in the market when there are over exuberant rallies. Now I want to focus in on something here. There's really kind of two points that I think are important to keep in mind with this data science model. The first is that if we're following off of history, whether even we have an over exuberant or overextended mid-cycle correction, or we have a confirmed market top, we haven't gotten that this time around in this data science model. In fact, 
we didn't even cross the red line here, right? We can see as we zoom in here that we had some periods of time where we got close to it, right? Just a couple uh, thousand dollars away, but we never really actually crossed the data science model. And usually when we cross it to set in that market top, we go far and beyond it within that month, month and a half. It's the real FOMO period of time where prices are exuberant. Uh, they are ignorant of the data science models. Market euphoria takes over. And the smart money again is sitting on standby thinking, okay, time to really start edging out some of these profits. But we never really did that. In fact, we rolled away from it before we corrected. And it's important to note that, you know, whether in this case you want to just look at 2017, right, where we had multiple times where we either barely crossed the line or didn't make it above the line throughout the cycle, or let's just go ahead and take a look at the earliest cycle here. We had many times where we got close to that value here, the two-year moving average, right? Only here, eventually, crossing over. Now, again, you don't have as much uh, price activity to work with here. You don't have a full-on two-year moving average because the market data wasn't there at the time. But I digress on the point here that for this data science model, we haven't had any actual cross and along with that as well. If that wasn't enough to be convincing that this is just a mere correction rather than a bear market, taking a more optimistic tone. The important thing that the two-year MA has shown us this time around is how the market has changed. The market has changed immensely due to the excess of credit in the market, of borrowing and lending in the crypto space, derivatives, futures contracts, and the sheer ability to trade and increase risk with leverage and margin trading. And I want to talk about how that dynamic has changed it. And it's not just me saying that we can see it within the price action. For example, we saw it in one of the fastest recoveries out of the uh, kind of capitulation or accumulation period. Back here, December 15th, right? Early January, we were down here around $3,100 per Bitcoin. We escape out of there with near exponential velocity towards around 14,000. The data science model won't give us the exact figure, but we went up towards around 14K for Bitcoin. We sure as heck didn't do that back here in 2017. In fact, it took us to get that same kind of multiple, right? the same kind of multiple in price. It took us a far longer period here from January 15th going towards, you know, not even technically speaking, here towards June of 2016, and really probably starting to have to charter towards that period of time where we broke towards all-time highs or got closer to it, right? And we can see back here, right, back here in the bear market of 2011, we did have a similar kind of range of price um, price rally here. We went from around two, a little over $2 towards around $7 per coin, right? Back here in the first major uh, recovery or accumulation period. So not everything is exactly like 2017. Everyone works with it because it's the most familiar cycle. When in reality, just because it may be the most liquid previous cycle we have to work with, or most relevant or recent cycle, doesn't mean that it's the most important, right? Now, when we consider that we had this overextension here, we obviously needed to have a pullback. And we came back down here albeit that we did have, I think, a low point of 3,800, generally somewhere around 4,000, 5,000. You can see here on the indicators, we started to get out of the peak capitulation candle that really only lasted for a very short window of time. What's really interesting is that if you take the time frames here, you've got December 2018, you've got March of 2020, you're talking about a year, uh, generally because it's really 2019, just to rough it off, a year and three to four months. Right? If we add a year in three to four months here from the previous cycle in 2017, it takes us to January 2016, and then we add a couple months in, we're getting around somewhere in April of 2016. Right, right around this point. We got about a double in price here. What do you know? It's about exactly what we did here. If you consider all, you know, remove all of the volatility and the noise here in the market. We did roughly the same in this case, considering in this case that we have expanding cycles, generally speaking, from top to bottom, lengthening periods of time from top to bottom, or bottom to top. 
that we still were able to perform roughly around the same during that period of time. Even with the rally to 14K and the dip to 3,800, 3, we still came out at around the same performance range. Now, why is that? Why is it that we're seeing um, this similarity here? You know, when we when we start to you know negate the volatility in the market that is caused by excessive credit, where people are buying large amounts and the people who have been shorting get short squeezed out of their positions, right? they have to cover for themselves and therefore they have to buy the underlying asset that they originally sold. That leads to excessive rallies, and with that as well, during periods of time when people are excessively long when they shouldn't be, they get liquidated. And that causes the domino effect of selling more crypto, the opposite effect of a short squeeze. Even with these exaggerated moves that are caused by this excessive credit in the market, we always kind of originate back to the mean of where we should be. And that's the really important thing that the two-year MM multiplier tells us. It tells us something very clearly here that I think a lot of people still don't want to face when it comes to April and May of this year. The reason we corrected is because we were overextended, plain and simple, case in point. We have never, in this case, seen the valuation increase here that we saw here from January of this year. And really, if you want to take it back here to you know October in the fall, from October here to March and April in Bitcoin's price, we have never seen such value growth. Now, percentage-wise, yes, we've seen greater rallies in the past. But each cycle has generally uh, overall declining returns. This is not something that's new. And if we take a look from bottom, in this case, back here in December 2018, to where we are, which is midway through 2021, right? we're talking over two years here. If we just rough it off to starting off at 2019, two and a half years, right? we're at $34,000 versus the low of 30, or excuse me, 3,400. It's a 10x multiple. Let's go ahead and do the same here. Two and a half years. January 2017, we had six more months. We're talking about June of 2017. So bottom here of 200. Let's go ahead, take it up here to June of 2017. Price generally ranged at this time at a peak of around $3,000. Or 2800. We were on 200 back then. Even after this correction, we have provided nearly the exact same multiple in price for Bitcoin. A little bit less if you want to take that 3K peak in there. But as these are small divergences, if anything, this tells us that quite frankly, we are still probably well ahead for where we should be. Now, this doesn't mean we have to correct in price. And I want you guys running for the hills just because I said that. And as I mentioned way at the beginning of the video, one data science model doesn't give us confirmation for anything. Okay. What I do want to say, though, is that this data science model is telling. It's telling that even if we push sideways for a little while, we're still right on place for where we should be. If not, we are ahead of where we should be. There is some level of overt optimism here, whether it's institutions, whether it's the new wave of retail, right? And even as things have died down as of recent, Bitcoin's not in the news as much, crypto's not at the top of the discussion as much, this is that quiet period of time where as much as everyone's fearful of crypto, we're right where we should be. Plain and simple, right? And again, bearing in mind here, if you do believe in the idea of expanding cycles, how each time we've been expanding from bottom to top, we're ahead of schedule. Doing good. So as we've seen the continued strength in the altcoin market, and as Bitcoin has still been hanging in this accumulation phase, I'm not worried because I'm seeing increased risk taking in altcoins, and I'm seeing Bitcoin hold up quite well. And over the last couple of days, last couple of weeks, we haven't revisited that doomsday $28,000 price range, which albeit was historic support back here. It looks like we're finally starting to reverse the trend here, slowly but steadily. Higher lows, consistent resistance range, building up an ascending triangle, potentially breaking out 
And look at that, a nice printed $35,000 price on Bitcoin. Right where we were back here in early May. I'll let you guys do with all this however you will. But I hope that this was a thought provoking piece. And if you've, you know, if you've got some friends or family in this case who are kind of in a, or maybe a community that you're a part of and stuff who are kind of feeling the fear in the market or feeling the kind of stagnation, I hope you guys can share this video because this is the time period to get optimistic when no one's talking about it, when everyone's fearful. We're always here, here on the Data Dash channel, especially to cover these types of moments. If I had large sums of fiat in this case, and it made sense to take the risk, I would. But I'm not gonna advise you guys to do anything. This is just solely for me. Everyone's on a different risk profile. Everyone's in a different time of their life. Everyone's got different concerns. These data science models can help you a lot. And it's why in the Dash Report, our newsletter, we talk about these data science models every single month. We cover at least three within the Dash Report that we're keeping our eye on that give us a good state of the market so we can get a good diverse approach to what the market is telling us. But so far, it's telling us that we've not only not seen the market top down, that we've probably got a ways to go here into 2022. Anyways, guys, that's it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching, giving me time to ramble with you all. And today, I'd like to say I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.